Good morning. How we doing, Severn? Come on in and get settled. I want to welcome you to a very big Sunday, very big Sunday. If you're hopping in for the first time or the first time in a while, a very good Sunday to do so. Um, a, a friend of mine who was well-versed in the world of preaching once told me that the two things people like doing the most are starting something and ending something, and today we are ending something that we started all the way back in September, and that is our series out of the, the book of 1 Peter called Intact. Started this all the way back in September, and here we are 19 rounds later, and we are, we are closing out the book. And whenever I, whenever I approach the end specifically of a New Testament letter, you know, my anticipation kind of builds and I, you know, I almost get the feeling like I'm sitting on the edge of my seat because you might not, you know, believe this, but when I teach through a book of the Bible, I don't look ahead. I just kind of focus on that verse that week and, you know, get there and try to pray over it and, and, and let it work on me and then hopefully beat somebody else up with it. So I don't really like look ahead a whole lot. So it's kind of been, you know, unless you read ahead and, you know, you're kind of in the same boat as me, uh, I was excited to see how Peter would end this letter. Because even in preaching school, they tell you when you preach... Um, you know, you want to hit as hard as you can in your conclusions. I mean, in your intro, you want to raise a need and, and, and give people a reason to lean in. And uh, in, their, in your body, you really want to challenge them, hit them where they live. But in your conclusion, that's where you want to, you want to leave something really memorable ringing in their ears. You want to give them something tangible that they can hold on to, something they can take home, something that, um, that really changes the way that they go through life. Because this is what they're going to remember. This is what's going to ring in their ears. And I think this is even more so the case with a letter like 1 Peter. And the reason I say that is because, remember, Peter wrote this letter to people who had already suffered dearly simply for, for saying that they follow Jesus. The, the cultural climate of, uh, in the Roman Empire regarding Christianity was bad and getting worse. The guy who wrote this letter has already seen good friends of his die you know, by murder, simply for, for claiming to follow Jesus. And so Peter knew firsthand that a lot of the people that received this letter were, were going to give their life for the sake of, of Jesus. Peter was actually well acquainted with the fact that he would probably have to give his one day too. And history tells us that he did. History says that Peter was crucified upside down. He chose the upside down part because he didn't consider himself worthy to die in the way that his Savior did. And so when, when Peter wrote these words, he wrote what he knew very well might be the last thing that these people ever hear from him. And if you've been along for the ride in this letter, it's been an, I mean, it's been an amazing five chapters. You know, the, the way that Peter started off just reminding God's people of their identity in Jesus and how nothing and no one can take away who God says we are when we give our life to his son, which is such a, such a powerful idea because I think one of the one of the problems that leads to every other problem in our lives in this life is very simply, we just forget who we are. You know, we get out here and we get hit and we get hurt and we get confused and we start doubting things that we thought we knew. And so Peter started this letter saying, this is who you are, like it or not. No matter what happens, nothing changes who you are in Jesus. You know, Peter broke into what, what Christianity looks like inside the household of faith, challenged people who claim to be Jesus followers to love their Christian brothers and sisters with a tenacious kind of love, a stubborn kind of love, to quote the Lumineers, even if we have reasons that we might think are, are good reasons to stop loving each other. You know, then he broke out into what Christianity looks like outside the four walls of the church, and he talked about how you and I can in, impact people in a positive way with our faith. How to live Christianity out in, in, a, in a society, in a government that's hostile to it. How to live Christianity out in a hostile work environment. He even told us what our marriages should look like. And then Peter got right to the theme of this letter, which is suffering. How to suffer well. And we, that's really what we've been looking at for the last three or four weeks if you've been here. And it's all about how you and I can, can view suffering, can view those times in the furnace. What God can do in us and through us and for us and by us in him as he walks us through the most difficult parts of life. And all of that has led up to what we're going to read this morning. And what we're going to read this morning is what Peter decided to say for the end of this letter. What Peter wanted to leave ringing in the lives of the people that he might never get the chance to eat a meal with again. He might never get a chance to talk to again. Might never get the chance to pray with, to cry with, to laugh with again on this side of eternity. 
And so before we open this up, I just ask you to get there for a moment and ask yourself, if you were writing this letter, how, do you, how would you close this down? If you know that people you love might be on their way out or that you yourself might be, how, how would you close this thing down? How would you finish this letter out? That's what we're reading. And what you read in this section is a warning, an encouragement, and a promise. I'm in 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to pick it up in verse 8. And here's where Peter begins. He says, be serious, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. This is our first idea of three this morning. And it's that you have an enemy who's against you. You have an enemy who is against you. I found it uh, significant. I just know, I, I like to notice things like this. Peter has not mentioned the devil. He hasn't mentioned demonic activity a single time in this letter. And intentionally chooses to bring it up all the way at the end. Because he wanted it to be something that these people remember as they go throughout life. But what I found interesting is that when Peter brought up the devil... He doesn't just say, remember the devil, or think about the devil, or consider the devil. He says to be serious about him. He says to be alert about him. And that word alert means, it means to pay strict attention to something. Peter's telling us to pay strict attention to the devil and his activity. And the reason that he would call us to pay strict attention to who he is and what he does is very simply because what he does is never obvious. There's a subtlety to the way that our enemy works. You shouldn't expect it to just jump off the page. You don't have to pay strict attention to something that's obvious. Peter knows that. You know, there's, a, uh, there's a, an iconic line in this movie called The Usual Suspects where the main character says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Amen. And it's true. It's true. That's exactly what Peter's talking about here. That's why he's saying to be alert regarding this thing, to be serious about this thing. Because it's entirely possible to be influenced by the devil, to have his activity present in your life, his influence present in your life, and and for you to be totally unaware of it. That's a sobering thing. So be alert. Not long ago, I read this story about a um, doctor named Ignaz Semmelweis, which I am told by a German doctor who attends this church that I actually pronounced that correctly. Not, not, I'm surprised, I was surprised. I actually checked with him before I preached this sermon. I don't know how I did at 9 a.m., but, but for this one. Uh, he, was a, he was a European doctor, an obstetrician. If you remember from last week's, uh, I told a funny little story last week about my, um, my endeavor into obstetrics. Uh, and obst- obstetrics, an obstetrician is a doctor who works primarily with pregnant women and their children, specifically around the time of childbirth. And so uh, this guy Semmelweis, he was a doctor in the uh, 1800s in a very important teaching and research hospital called Vienna General. And his work really revolved around getting to the bottom of a horrendous mortality rate in the maternity ward of this hospital, where the mortality rate had actually gotten so bad it was one in ten. Meaning, if ten women gave birth in that maternity ward, one of them did not survive. Unreal. It was so bad, and it was so famous for how bad it was, that women would intentionally give birth out in the streets and then go into the hospital with their newborn, which I don't know at what point a hospital has to recalibrate its practices, but when people are intentionally giving birth outside because they're terrified to do it under your roof, you've done something wrong, okay? And so they started to investigate this problem, and uh, they, they gave a name for all the symptoms that revolved around these deaths, and they just called it childbed fever, because that's where women were dying, on their childbed. And so what they did, that, you know, the, the smartest thing they could think of doing was they isolated each symptom and tried to treat each symptom um, specifically. So for instance, if, if uh, the patient was experiencing inflammation, then they would bleed the patient and apply leeches in a process called bloodletting, which I am so thankful to God I don't live in an era where bloodletting is considered a thing. Because if it came down to inflammation or a mason jar full of leeches, I'm just going to meet Jesus that day. I don't want the leeches. Life doesn't mean that much to me. If, uh, if they were having, it's a weird thing to say, but if you can't get honest here, uh, you got uh, 
That's, you, if, <laughs> we just got to move on. If, um, <laughs> if the patient was uh, experiencing like trouble breathing, they would work on ventilation. And they did this with every single symptom, but nothing worked. Nothing worked. Nothing made any measurable difference. And so... Um, he started to kind of uh, obsess over this because the sad thing was that the patients being treated in that hospital and specifically in that section of that hospital knew what was up. That hospital was famous for how many people it was killing. And so patients were known, these new mothers were known to be on their knees, wringing their hands, begging to be moved to a different section of that hospital where the, the, the mortality rate was, still wasn't great, but it was a whole lot better. And so, um, you know, so Semmelweis got to work on this. He had a heart for people. He cared about what he did. And so they started investigating. And um, the only thing that he noted, you know, the thing that, that kind of, was most significant to him was that the ward that he worked in was the worst ward in the hospital, mortality rate wise. And so we started looking at what's the difference between where I work and where everybody else works. And the only significant thing that immediately jumped out to him was uh, that the ward where he worked, the section where he worked was attended by doctors, whereas the wards that fared a little bit better were attended by midwives. But he couldn't figure out why that in and of itself could explain anything. So he just decided we're gonna standardize practice. So he decided in, in every area of the hospital, there's going to be a standard position that women give birth in. There's going to be a standard way, standard way that we ventilate rooms, standard uh, diet. He even standardized the way that they did laundry and nothing changed. Nothing put a measurable dent in what was going on. But then something happened. Something very interesting happened. He took a four-month leave to a, um, a neighboring hospital. And upon returning to Vienna General... He, he discovered that the mortality rate had significantly fallen in his absence, which, of course, you know, is making him think twice about the way that he's living. And so he started digging around and asking himself, why in my absence are things so much better? And his research led him to believe that there was a significant relation um, to, to the, uh, the time that he and the rest of the doctors were practicing medicine on cadavers, okay? Vienna General was a teaching and research hospital, and so, because it was a teaching and research hospital, the doctors there that worked there would split their time pretty much down the middle between cadavers or dead people and live patients. And they would go directly from working on a cadaver to helping a woman deliver her baby. Yeah. That's how I felt when I read that, which is kind of a disgusting thing to you and I, but give them credit back in the mid-1800s, they hadn't really uh, developed a theory of germ theory and things like this, so it didn't seem weird to them. But as Semmelweis started digging around, he discovered that those doctors that took his place during his four-month leave when things got so much better, the only thing that they did different is not work on cadavers, which is what he spent so much time doing. So his research led to what is really the precursor to germ theory, and he discovered that um, the these, these invisible germs that they called particles were being transmitted by cadavers and unhealthy patients to healthy patients on the hands of the physicians themselves. And so as soon as he got his mind wrapped around this, uh, that, like that moment he mandated the doctors would wash their hands in a chlorine and lime solution before treating any uh, live patient. And, and simply with that practice alone, overnight, the mortality rate went from 1 in 10 to 1 in 100. Now, the, uh, the lesson that Semmelweis learned there, and this is kind of a profound truth that applies to what Peter's talking about, is that there is often things going on behind the scenes in life that you and I can't see. And we can waste a lot of time treating symptoms that we can see without realizing that the real cause, the real source is something that's a little bit more intangible, a little bit harder to detect. And that's exactly what Peter's talking about here with this idea of the devil. Now, there's, there's, two, there's two mistakes that people historically make when you start talking about the devil. One is to give them way too much credit, and the other, not nearly enough. All right, some people assign, like, every bad thing in life to the devil, which the Bible never does. Like, if you do something stupid, the devil made me do it, is not a viable like, the Bible never really allows you to say that. But some people will do that. And it's like with, with anything. I've known people, you've probably known people, have a bad night's sleep, you got an insomnia demon trying to haunt you. You know, flat tire on the way to work, that's definitely a car demon kind of thing, which is just kind of ridiculous. I, I was at a, uh, when I was 10 years old, I experienced what was, by a wide margin, the most miserable birthday party in my life. 
okay? And I'm going to revisit that now on a Sunday morning. And I've realized preaching is a really cathartic thing for me because I just get a chance to talk about all the miserable experiences I've had in life. So buckle up for the group counseling session. So there I was, 10 years old. My buddy was turning 10 years old and, and so a bunch of 10 years old r- running around. For some reason that I can't explain to this day, throughout the course of this birthday party, every single 10-year-old, with the exception of one, every single one of us erupted into tears throughout the span of this birthday party. No idea why. However, here's what I remember about this birthday party. At the end of it, my friend's mom rallied up the troops and informed us that the devil had gotten into that birthday party. (laughs) Let me just, for the new parents out there, If your 10-year-old is not having a good birthday party, you will not improve the quality of that party by telling him that Satan is also at his party. (laughs) That's God's word for somebody, okay? That's how some people tend to view the the devil, D-E-B-B-I-L, the devil. He's at this birthday party, he's, he's whatever. Other people make exactly the opposite mistake. And actually, I would say most people in our culture make exactly the opposite mistake. They completely ignore his presence, his activity, his reality altogether. And let me just say something that, you know, I think you and I can both um, say amen to. It, pop culture in our culture right now would suggest if you start talking about a personal devil, you're going to be seen as kind of an idiot, Right, Like most people in our culture scoff at this idea. But let me add this. That's really unique to our culture. Most people on this planet right now have no problem with this. Like if you go to, the, to Central America, South, South America, Africa, the Middle East, the Far East, most people on this planet really don't have a difficult time grasping the concept of an intangible, supernatural, evil force. But in our culture, we do. We laugh at that. Um, and, and so what you live in, what we live in, is a very secular, very humanistic, very naturalistic culture. And so what that means is we tend to view the problems of this world purely through a natural lens. We believe that what we can see is all there is, and therefore our natural problems can be solved through natural remedies. If that's true, let me ask something. Why haven't they been solved yet? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I got two amens on that one. How about that? That, keep, them, keep them coming. They're, they're more than welcome on a Sunday morning. But, but honestly, like, you know, I don't know if you've had your head buried in the sand recently with this thing called the Me Too movement. But if you have any kind of social media, you know that it is, it's kind of unreal what's being unearthed that's been going on for decades in Hollywood and in politics to the tune of rampant physical and sexual abuse to women and children. And it's not like it just started happening, like it's been going on for a really long time. And so in our culture, we believe, well, if we just had better law enforcement, if we just had better education, if we just had better economic opportunities, better elected officials, then all these problems would go away. But to me, from where I stand, that's a very naive way of looking at the world. That's a very naive way of looking at the world. And what it doesn't answer is why, despite all these technological breakthroughs we've had, despite all these breakthroughs in in, in science, in, in, uh, you know, in economics, in in, uh, psychology, why is it that you and I live on a planet right now that is experiencing simultaneous epidemics of obesity and hunger? What? Like, think about that for a second. You know, and and for for those that would say, well, I believe in science, whatever that means, like you pray to Bill Nye, I don't even get that. But for those that would say, I believe in science, let, let me just point something out. Science has not cured the problem of violence. You know what science has done? It's made us considerably better at it. There used to be a time when you had to kill people one at a time with a big rock. And now you can hit a button and kill like hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, it's like sometimes I think about these things and wonder, what's God think when he sits back? What kind of sovereign patience are we really dealing with here that tolerates that, you know? And again, if, 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 natu- if all we got is natural problems and they can be solved through natural solutions, why is there such thing as racism? Why is there such thing as inequality, as oppression, as injustice? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because there's more to this world's problems than meets the eye. And you can go about it like Dr. Semmelweis 
You can go about it just looking at the surface level symptoms and trying to treat them one by one, or you can realize there is something going on behind the scenes that we can't see that's at work, kind of engineering and maybe even orchestrating a lot of this. And I'll I'll make that even more personal. Not only is there something going on behind the scenes in the problems of this world, there's something going on behind the scenes in the problem of your life. There is a supernatural entity that's evil that the Bible refers to as the devil, He does prowl around like a roaring lion. His desire is to devour you. And walking through life oblivious to that is exactly what he wants. Exactly what he wants. And so the question is raised, well, what do we do about it? And that's exactly where Peter goes next. What he says in verse 9, I just want to read the first half. He says, resist him and be firm in the faith. Pause. That's an interesting thing that we're being told to resist him. Because unless you're visiting us today from the church of Satan, I assume everybody wants to resist the devil, right? And even if you don't necessarily believe what what the Bible says is true, if you will concede that there may be something like the devil, you would want to resist a supernaturally evil force, okay? What's interesting is that we've we've just been told, you know, by implication here, that he's subtle, that he's not obvious. We need to be alert because it's not gonna jump off the page. It's not apparent to us. And now we're being told to resist him. That kind of puts us in a tough position because it's, it's, it's easy to resist obvious things. It's, it's much more difficult to resist the subtleties of an enemy that might be at work while you're not even aware. So it raises the question, how do you resist something that you can't see? And here's how Peter, here's how Peter says you resist the devil. I'm, I'm all about teaching that's helpful. I'm all about, about teaching that helps people live life better because that's what, that, that's what I understand the purpose of the Bible is. Here's how you resist an enemy who wants to devour you. You resist him by knowing that the same sufferings are being experienced by your brothers in the world. Now that alone tells us so much about the way that the enemy operates. Think of it this way. When Peter talks about the devil to us, he's he's inspired by God. I believe the entire Bible is the inspired word of God written by God through authors. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit to talk about Satan as a roaring lion. Like he could have used any metaphor, any simile, any, any word picture there, but he said that the enemy is like a roaring lion. The reason I find that significant is because researchers have studied the hunting habits of lions. And I, I, this, this really did surprise me, that lions will not hunt packs of animals. And if, like if I, I guess I would have made a terrible lion, because that's what I would have done. I would think like if you just play the odds and run into a whole crowd of, of zebra, one of them's going to like run into the other one and trip them up and there you go, job, job well done kind of thing. But that's not, how they, that's not how they operate. What lions will intentionally do is isolate prey. And their hunts are actually much more uh, statistically successful when they do it. That's the way that your enemy wants to devour you. That's his hunting tactic. And so to, to speak to that reality and to, to in, inform the way that you and I are to resist his tactics, what Peter does here is point us to our Christian brothers and sisters, and in doing so, he reminds us of one of the most comforting realities in the world. Ready? Here, here, here's, here's what he reminds us of. Here's what he reminds you of. Let this be the word of God for somebody. Wherever you are and whatever you're going through, you are not alone. Amen. A lot of amens on that one. This is our second idea that, hey, number one, amen, you have an enemy who's against you. But number two, do not forget you have people who are in this with you. Based on what I see in in just this passage alone, which is such a valuable text, you know, learning how your enemy works. What I see here is that one of the primary ways the devil wants to devour you is by getting you to believe that you're the only one dealing with what you're dealing with and you're the only one going through what you're going through. And I'll tell you why he wants you to believe that because if he can get you to believe it, he can get you alone. And understand what's being said here. When when Peter says that you and I have to know that, that the same sufferings are being experienced by our brothers and sisters throughout the world, that word sufferings is not just, you know, the hard stuff in life. That's not just, you know, you get a bill that you can't pay or whatever. That word can also be translated uh, sinful passions. That also is referring to desires that you struggle with that you don't want to have. Sins that you've been battling with, that you've been trying to fight, but you've also been failing. 
temptations that you're mad at yourself for having, that you didn't choose to have, that you don't want to have anymore. That's, all of that is encompassed in that idea there. The enemy's primary tactic is to get you to believe that you're the only one that deals with that. Because if he can, he's going to keep you isolated. If, if he can get you to believe that, he's going to keep you from ever getting it out in the open. He's going to keep you from ever being honest with anyone else about where you really are in life. See, when the Bible tells us to confess our sins one to another, it's not because another person has the authority to, to forgive your sin. It's just because confession one to another is one of the best ways to deal with sin. It's one of the most cathartic experiences in life. So, of course, your enemy doesn't want that. He wants you to keep your walls up, to not talk about what's going on in your life. And, and, and in doing that, what will happen is a fear will develop in your life. And that habit, that mindset, that hang up, that desire, that addiction, that mistake, that whatever it is, it, its roots are going to dig down deeper in your life. It's going to be harder and harder and harder to deal with. And if he can get you to live that way long enough, he can paralyze you. And I, let me just, let me just, I hope this comforts somebody. Your enemy cannot take your salvation away once you've given your life to Jesus. The Bible could not be more clear about that. Jesus said nobody can snatch us out of the, out of the grip of, of God the Father's hand, Okay. Uh, you know, Romans tells us nothing can separate us from the love of God is found in Christ Jesus. Um, they're, they're, you know, it's, it's called the doctrine of eternal security. Your enemy can't do anything to get you unsaved, but he can paralyze you because that's the next best thing for him. That's what he wants to do. And so many people live paralyzed lives because they don't know what Peter is saying is the one thing you have got to know if you want to resist the devil. You have to know. And so I'll just, I'm going to drive this home this morning because Peter saw fit to end this letter with this. You have got to know that the people sitting next to you this morning are dealing with the same stuff that you are. Now, not everybody is, but somebody is. I'm not saying go throw your deepest, darkest out on Facebook today. In fact, I'm saying don't do that today, but somebody Somebody here is going through the same stuff that you are. Somebody's got the same mindset that you have. Somebody's made the same mistakes that you have. Somebody's convinced themselves that they are the world's worst spouse, the world's worst parent, the world's worst person. Somebody's got the same inability to get past their past just like you. Your enemy wants you to forget that. The Holy Spirit of God wants you to know it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you something. This has been one of the most comforting Bible verses to me. This has helped me out in my walk with God so many times. And this is, this is exactly what a, a passage like this brought to mind. I'm in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. I have turned to that passage more than a few times in my life just to be strengthened by this, this reality that wherever I am and wherever you are, God has provided a way out for you. Meaning when you've given your life to Jesus, you might find yourself in, in a furnace. You might find yourself in a valley. You might find yourself in a, in a desolate place, but you will not find yourself in a corner. You will not ever be in a place where there is no way of escape. God has provided it. Might not be easy to find all the time, might not be an easy path to walk, and it might not be a very quick path to walk, but there is a way out of where you are. But what I, what I love about that specific verse is that it begins with the author Paul telling us that no temptation has overtaken you except what's common to humanity. That means whatever you bring to the table, you're not unique, you're not weird, you're not abstract, we're all sinners. And we break in generally the same ways. That's why Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. People have been getting weird since they've been getting weird. We're all in it together. I mean, that's what that means. That's what that means. That wherever you are, whatever you're dealing with, whatever this passage brings to mind for you, you're not alone. That's what Peter wants you, that's what, the, that's what God wants you to remember. Your enemy wants to isolate you in your sin, in your discouragement, in your doubt, in your fear, in your struggle, in your condemnation, in your all of it. He wants you to believe that putting up your walls is a sign of strength, that everybody else has their life put together, that dropping your walls is a sign of weakness, that if you ever got honest with anybody, man, they'd stamp you with a red A, they'd run you out of this place, you'd ruin your reputation, they'd never look at you the same again. 
If you're hearing things like that, if you've believed things like that, I'm gonna tell you something that might sound crazy. You're under the influence of the devil. You didn't expect to come to church today and hear that you, you're under the influence of the devil. But that's how he operates. And the reason that God puts things like this in his word, telling us to know that people are in this with us, telling us that no temptation's overtaken us, but, but what's common to people, he put that in there because he knew the first lie we believe when we start breaking is, man, I bet I'm the only one. And the solution to that is to know that people are in this with you. But let me, let me tell you why Peter did not include this at the end of this letter. He did not include this so people could hear it drive home and feel better about themselves for about 30 minutes and then go about life as they were. He put this in, in the word of God, this is in the word of God so that we would do the one thing that comes so unnaturally to most of us, which is actually let our walls down and let somebody on into our life and, and, and go into their life. You know, the, the implied command here, the only way that you can know that other people are dealing with the same stuff that you're dealing with is if you actually get outside of your, or yourself and into their life and actually take the mask off for more than three seconds and let somebody into yours. And you don't let everybody into your life and you don't go into everybody's life, right? Wisdom would say that that's just unwise, but, but somebody needs to be brought in. Somebody does. The Bible talks about there's a friend that's closer than a brother. That's who gets that privilege. That's who gets that VIP pass, and God has brought people into your life. When he grafted you into his family, he made sure that there's somebody, somebody that can walk with you through whatever you're walking with. See, and this is what the Bible talks about when it's referring to community, which we just forget about in a culture as individualistic as ours. But know this, community is not something that God says, if you got the time in your busy schedule, make some time for it. Community is something that God said he has hardwired you to need. Even before sin, and, sin entered the world, God said in Genesis 2.18 that it is not good for people to be alone. All right, this idea that all you need is God has, is ridiculous. God didn't even say that. You need people in your life. And you can't get that kind of community over a cup of coffee during a five-minute break on Sunday morning. And this is why we offer small groups. This is why we make such a big deal about small groups. It's not because we're, we're interested in padding stats. It's because we're interested in seeing lives changed. And God says lives are changed in the context of community, in the context of deep relationships with Christian brothers and sisters, where people begin to find out this unbelievably cathartic reality that we're not all that different. We actually are going through the same stuff. We're in this boat together. That those relationships are, are birthed and born and grow out of our small groups. Now, as, 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 as great as this is, because personally, I do like hearing that I'm not the only one thinking what I think and doing what I do and dealing with what I deal with. I don't know if you're like me, but that's not enough for me in and of itself. Meaning, it's cool to sing kumbaya with your, with your brothers and sisters and talk about how hard life is, but I need to do more than that in life. I need a solution to my problems in life. I need hope when life gets hard, and that's exactly where this letter ends. Man, I love this verse. This is, this is 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 10, we're going to close it down here. It says, Now the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will personally, man, I love that. He doesn't see to it like through a liaison. He will personally restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you've suffered a little. The dominion belongs to him forever. Amen. Let me call the worship team up and we're gonna close down. This is our third idea today. This is, this is the final idea of the series from 1 Peter. That amen, you have an enemy who's against you and you have people who are in this with you, but don't you dare forget you have a God who is for you. This, where, where this passage ends is a promise that absolutely everyone who has given their life to Jesus can claim. The promise is that God himself personally will see fit to our restoration, to our establishing, to our strengthening, and to our support. And I want to end this series just by walking through what these four words really mean so you can understand what God has promised to personally do in your life. When Peter says that God promises to restore us, that word means to mend what has been broken. Let me, let me tell you, if you have ever felt broken in your life, that's not a weird thing. The strongest people in life can admit that they've been broken, as a matter of fact. And God promises that your life doesn't end in brokenness. It ends with him personally putting you back together. 
When Peter says that God promises to personally establish you, that word establish means to make stable. In other words, if you've ever been in a place in life where you do feel unstable, where you feel that you no longer have the strength to stand, when you feel like you don't know what the way is, and even if you did, you couldn't get there, and you need somebody to bring some kind of stability to the storm that is your life, that's what God says he's gonna do for you personally. Peter says that that this God that we serve will personally strengthen you, meaning you will find yourself in places in life when, when you realize, hey, I just can't do what he's called me to do. I can't take another step in the right direction. I can't get through what he's calling me to get through in and of my own power. That's not a weird thing. That's not, that shouldn't cause for panic in your life. That's you realizing how much you need the God who's called you out of darkness and into light. And he promises to personally give you that strength, to personally be that strength, to get you through what he's calling you to walk through. And at the end of it all, we have the promise that our God personally will support us. Meaning that he will lay the foundation in our lives from which we can stand on, we can work on, we can build on. And you may ask yourself, well, how is it that God could personally do this for sinners like us? The only answer is Jesus. The only answer is Jesus. Because what Jesus himself has done at Calvary is is he walked through the lack of that for us. If, If you've ever doubted whether or not God's really with you, whether or not God's really for you, all you have to do is go back to Calvary because at Calvary, what you see is that Jesus was not restored there. He was broken to pieces. Jesus was not established there. He was torn apart. He wasn't strengthened. He was made weak for you and I. He wasn't supported. He was abandoned, not just by the people that he came to save, but by his Father in heaven. And the reason that Jesus walked through all of that is so that you and I would never have to. The reason that that Jesus walked through all of that is so that everyone who called on his name would never have to fear that being the end of our story. And the promise that we have is even if we don't realize it, even if we can't see it, even if the the progress isn't as quick as we'd sometimes like it to be, we are being restored and established and strengthened and supported in Jesus. And so let me close out this series with this. I don't know what God's calling you to do in 2018. I know he's calling you to do something. I don't know what's next in your spiritual journey. I don't know what it looks like to follow in the footsteps of Jesus for you personally, but I know this. Even if you feel like you don't have the strength to do it anymore, even if you are riddled with discouragement, even if you feel isolated, know this, you're not, you're not. And in Jesus, you and I have the promise that whatever it is God's calling us to walk through, on the other side of it, when we stand before him, we will stand before him intact. Let me pray for us. God, I am so thankful for the promises that you have in scripture. God, just... The way that you, you've given us everything that we need in order to be the, 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 the people that you've called us to be, Father. The way that you warn us, the way that you look out for us, the way that you so lovingly guide us. We are fools to not look at your book, the manual for life, every moment of our lives, God. We're fools to not go back to you and ask you, how do I do this, God, because I need your help. God, and, and I just stand humbled. I stand so thankful that we have the promise that you personally, personally, you are, you're, you're going to restore us. You're going to support us. You're going to establish us. You're going to strengthen us and you're going to do it through Jesus, God. And I just pray for everybody here this morning, whatever they go home to later today, whatever they wake up to on Monday morning, that it would look a little bit smaller and you would look a little bit bigger. And the promises that you have for your people would ring more loudly, more clearly in their lives so that we could be the people that you're calling us to be. So that we could walk with our heads held high in confidence that even if we feel feel like we're being torn apart, we're not. Because in Jesus, we're intact, Father. We thank you for what you've done and we pray your will is done. In your holy name, amen.